Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So what we've done so far is... um, is uh, understand that we're alcoholic. That's the first part. Then uh, become willing to believe. And then, uh, and then make a decision to live a spiritual life through the third step prayer. And that's how far we've gotten. Now, so what's next? Uh, and it talks about launching, <laughs> that we launched out on uh, uh, this inventory. And, uh, and what we've done so far is we've, we've come to terms with our alcoholism and we, we turn to God. But see, the, the key to success in Alcoholics Anonymous is trust God, clean house, and work with others. And so, so now we've got a clean house. Now we've, we've introduced alcoholism and God into the equation, and now we've got to go look. Here's where most people really fall away. Um, most people, I don't think most people in Alcoholics or most of the people who come into Alcoholics Anonymous ever get an inventory done. A lot of people do. But see, even if you're in a step working group, um, you're, you're in the minority in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can tell you for a fact that I don't think, uh, 95% of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous do an 11th step. Uh, I don't think, uh, most people follow those directions. And the problem is that if we're unwilling to participate into this thing, uh, in its entirety, we're settling for a half a loaf. Um, so, so the first thing we're going to talk about is inventory. Inventory comes in three parts. First of all, you really need to have done a third step before you do this, because otherwise um, you aren't going to have the strength you need to get through an inventory. That's why the third step is in front of the fourth step. So as soon as you have God on your side and you feel like you're not alone, then even though it doesn't feel like it, we can have the courage to address the things we need to address in inventory. So how do you write an inventory? There are three parts to inventory. There's resentment, fears, and sex. Now, that sex is a misnomer. That's really about relationships, um, but it's called sex inventory um, because it's about intimate relationships. Um, resentment's the number one offender. It kills more alcoholics than anything else. Because the book says that, um, we probably ought to pay attention to it because if that's killing more of us than anything else, we probably ought to get familiar with it so it doesn't manage to do that with us. Um, in the first part, which is a resentment inventory, that's a grudge list. And that means uh, there's there are three different things that the book says we inventory, people, institutions, and principles. And so we'll start with people. I mean, that's the easiest one that usually comprises most of uh, the inventory that people write. And, and it's just whoever they're irritated with. And uh, so we, we write down people. Now, there's a set of directions in here, and I'll tell you what it says. And, and you, you know, if you have any questions about that, just look in the book. Um, the first column in the inventory, we write four column inventory. And the first column in the inventory is whoever you're mad at. 
whoever you have a resentment against, whoever you have a, had a grudge against. So you write the person's name in the first column. Uh, what we do is we write the whole first column first. We write down a list of all the people uh, first. Then once you have that list, you can start going across the columns. When you go across the columns in the second column, the book says the cause. So why, why are you resentful? Why do you have a grudge against this person? What did they do? Now, uh, some people want to write a novel in that second column, and I can tell you from my perspective that the second column doesn't tell you anything except that you're mad, and you already know that. So, so my sponsor would not allow me to write more than five or six words in the second column because he said it was a waste of time. As long as I know that I'm mad, uh, the most important part of this is what's that got to do with me? How was I involved? Because now we're going to look at our own mistakes. We're going to look at the obstacles in our path. So, um, um, so I write down why, I, why I'm mad at this person. And then in the third column, it says, affects my... It says what it affects. And, and it talks about a number of different things. It says self-esteem, security, ambitions, personal relations, sex relations. And some people write pocketbook, but we don't. We write um, uh, security, but we write that pocketbook thing under financial security. So... Uh, so I write down if I, why this person, whatever this person did to make me mad, how did that affect my self-esteem? What's my self-esteem? It's how I feel about myself. Okay. So how did it affect how I feel about myself? Did it make me feel better or worse or more or less or what? Well, how did it affect me? And how did it affect my security? So uh, what security? Well, I can be secure in a relationship. I can be financially secure. I can be job secure. I can, I can seek security in a whole bunch of different areas. And how did whatever that person do affect how I feel about being secured? Did it make me less secure? Did it, did it make me worry about my job? Did it make me worry about my Intimate relationships? Did it make me insecure about my children? Did it make me whatever? How did it affect my security? What are, how did it affect my ambitions? My ambitions are what I want to do or who I want to be. How did it affect that? Did it, did it, uh, did it make me think that I couldn't accomplish what I wanted to do? Did it uh, make me make me want to try harder? What did it do with my ambitions? How did it affect the way I treat other people? That's personal relationships. Okay. Um, did it did it make me mistrust other people? Did it make me look at other people differently? How did it affect my sex relations? That means if I'm in an intimate relationship, how did it affect that? Did, uh, did I get so upset about it that I couldn't relate with my partner? Did, uh, did I become mistrustful of, of whatever gender is the opposite or whatever or the same? I don't know. That thing is so confused these days. I don't you want to go there? Um, did it did it affect the way I felt about the person I was intimate with? Um, that's the third column. The fourth column was where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? And see, then I have to take a look at what I was up to. 
in the fourth column? Why was I selfish in that? What did I do? How did I try and turn that in my favor? What did I do that made him irritated in the first place? Where was I dishonest? Was there some dishonesty in the middle of it that may have created it? Where was I self-seeking? What was I trying to drag out of that to get for myself? And where was I frightened? Um, out of all of those things, fear is the most common. Fear is the most common in everything. You know, it's about so this whole thing's about self-centered fear. Um, uh, if you don't believe that, take a look at how often you're worried about what's going to happen to somebody else. <laughs> we really, we make a practice of living in self-centered fear, always worried about ourselves. So you answer those um, with people. So. Um, and then, uh, what, what kind of institutions can you, uh, can you inventory? Hmm? There you go. Huh? Employers, church, school, insurance, police, huh? Oh boy. <laughs> You know what? No, it's not. Not in an inventory. Do you know? I used to own a big T-shirt. I own a, a, a printing company, a silk screen company, and I printed T-shirts. I printed thirty-eight thousand T-shirts a day. It wasn't a little, you know, a little hand operation. I. Uh, did uh, shirts for, I, you remember Joe Camel and all that stuff? I did the bulk of those. And I was knocking out 30,000, 40,000 of those things a day. And uh, and the FBI raided my, my printing shop. They came in there with guns drawn. It scared the shit out of my receptionist. <laughs> And, I, and she said, Mr. Olson, there are a couple of armed FBI agents standing out here. And I said, well, send them back, you know. And uh, they came back there and said, we, we uh, have been uh, informed that you're violating uh, what the, uh, licensing laws. And I said, well, let me take you on a tour of this place, and we'll look in every corner of this, and if you can come up with anything that would indicate that I'm violating licensing laws, I'd sure like to know about it. So I took them on a tour, and they were all huffy, and uh, sure, they had the perp in hand. <laughs> and uh, we got all done, and I said, do you see anything that looks suspicious? And they said, uh, no. Uh, but this lady told us you were doing all this, and I said, well, she must have been pretty angry to tell you a whopper like that. And they said, well, we guess so. And I said, well, I have a question for you. And I said, you guys are FBI agents, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm just curious. What do you do when you're not chasing screen printers? <laughs> And he said, we'd chase fugitives. And I said, well, did you run out of fugitives? <laughs> you know what? I put my life online for this country several times. And I'm some government thug from the FBI or the IRS or any other place, they come around me, they're going to get more than they want. <laughs> so they went away and never came back. You can stand up for you, you know. You don't have to cave in because it's the government. You don't have to cave in for anything. That if you're a child of God, you're you. 
you can stand up for yourself and you have every right to do it. So, yes, ma'am. Georgia? No, sorry. Um, it just occurred to me while you were talking about um, resentments to institutions. I have sponsored two women that had huge resentments against AA. And I no longer sponsor either of them. But I just, you know, it was, it was always, you know, I'd have them write about it and to look at it and, you know, like this is, you know, what is AA? It's us, you know. <laughs> but I just wondered if you have any thoughts about that and if, um, you know, if, if you've encountered that or if anybody else has encountered that, those resentments with AA. and Why were they angry? They were angry because nobody paid attention to them. Um, because nobody, because um, they weren't the center of attention, because there were cliques, because, um, um, you know, the, both of them, I mean, they both were sort of like a little bit different, but the one was, there are all these cliques, um, I'm not part of the cliques, you know, and I was kind of like, what does this have to do with you? You know, what's your part in this? <laughs> Um, to try and, and look at that. But um, the other one, you know, that, that wasn't around for a while, nobody called her. Um, you know, there's people that are angry. There's <laughs> Sure. Um, so I just, I was, it just occurred to me, I thought it would be interested to see what your thoughts were, if anybody else has any thoughts about that or has encountered that. Oh, thank you. Um, there are clicks in a... It's it's inevitable. It's it's always going to happen. Uh, some people will form friendships in Alcoholics Anonymous, but the biggest click in AA is those recovered and those who are not recovered. Now, and that's that click is called a fellowship of the spirit, right? Alcoholic. A strange thing happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, if you come in and you engage in the recovery program, you and you get through all 12 steps. When you're done with that, you have formed a bond with a whole lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the fellowship of the spirit is that common experience of having gone through all these spiritual exercises we call steps. So once you've done that, you know, if I go fifth step, I'll go fifth step with anybody that has been through the work, has been through the steps. I'm not afraid of it. They've been there where I've been. They know what I'm doing. They know what my intent is. They know all of that. And in, in fact, after I went through the steps the first time with my sponsor, I went back the second time and I said, Don, I'd really uh, like you to take me back through the steps because I think... You know, my ego is rebuilding itself, and it's time that I do this again. And he went, no. And I said, why not? And he said, I already showed you how to do it. Now you go show somebody how to do it. And I said, how's that help me go through the work? And he said, go through the work at the same time they do. And then trade fifth steps. And so that's what I did. And I started taking other people through the steps. And, and they were asking all kinds of questions I'd never asked. And I asked a lot of questions. And so they're asking me questions, and I'm learning more and more about this program by experiencing taking this new person through the steps. Well, um, the, the real click in AA is the Fellowship of the Spirit. And the basis for that fellowship is the common experience of having gone through the steps. There is a fellowship and a trust that arises out of that common experience that will never arise when it's not there. And there are, there are people who come into Alcoholics Anonymous, in my experience, who avoid the steps like the plague, who just hang around and hope for the best and want to be part of the deal and all the rest of that, and they never give themselves to recovery. And see other people who have been through the steps, 
will watch those people and be suspicious of them. And they're suspicious because they never engage in the process, so they start wondering what the hell are they here for. See, my desperation drove me to get through this process so I don't have to drink anymore. And so I look at people who are not driven by that kind of desperation and wonder what's going on there. So it's not unusual to have clicks. Um, some of them for good reasons, some of them for bad reasons. Do you know that, that likes attract in Alcoholics Anonymous? Do you know that? Yep. That means step workers hang out with step workers and bullshitters hang out with bullshitters. <laughs> People, uh, speaking of intuition, <laughs> Um, that's not some magical thing happens when you get done with step 12. <laughs> intuition doesn't work like that. People who just come through the door have intuition. It's just that they don't believe it most of the time or they ignore it. So, you know, once you, once you, you train yourself to work with your intuition in Alcoholics Anonymous, you start to trust it. Um, so people will come into Alcoholics Anonymous and they'll kind of head towards what they want. Uh, if they want to be sober but still run their scam, that's what they'll do. They'll come into Alcoholics Anonymous and they'll try and run the same bullshit on you they tried to run outside. And nothing ever happens. They stay just as sick as the day they came through the door. Uh, other people will come into Alcoholics Anonymous and say, I'm dying from alcoholism. It is the primary issue in my life today, and I need to do something about that. And they will intuitively seek a person with an answer. And so if you sit in a meeting and you talk about recovery instead of what a bullshit time you're having with your day, God, that bothers me. I went to a meeting the other day, and it, it, it was a contest about who was having the worst time. <laughs> and everyone was venting. You know, I wish I could have got them all in the same room and turned the lights off and locked a damn thing and said, you deserve each other. <laughs> so... People will come in, you know, people come in looking for partners. Um, you know, and that stuff's going on all the time. So some people just want to come in and find somebody to be intimate with. And there's a lot of that going on in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's, uh, that's fairly normal by observation anyway. You know, people come in here for all sorts of reasons. Uh, marginally mentally ill people come in to establish social platforms. Some people come in to Alcoholics Anonymous because they think we're all stupid. We just had a guy come through Denver again. This is probably the fifth time in the last 30 years. I've watched him come through every time, and every time he leaves with somebody else's money. And he is a liar and a thief and a non-alcoholic, and he thinks we are dumber than boards. And uh, the last three times he's come through Denver, uh, I've told him that in the middle of an AA meeting. And then he gets up and leaves, and he doesn't come back. But he's charismatic enough to take over meetings. And he, the place that I looked for sponsees in that meeting, he was in there and had virtually wrested control away from the board of that meeting. And they came to me and they said, what do we do about this? And I said, tell them to leave. And they said, you can't do that. And, they, and I said, who told you that? <laughs> and I said, if you'd care to call the general service office, you'll find that uh, that there are a couple of reasons why you can kick people out of AA meetings. And they are, 
number one, if they're so disruptive that uh, that you can't run meetings um, the way they're supposed to be run or the way you choose to run them, if they're so disruptive that you can't, that they just make the meeting go through a meltdown, tell them to, you can tell them to leave. Or if they represent any kind of threat, physical, financial, uh, whatever, threat to the members or their families, you can ask them to leave. And that's from the general service office. So I, I said, this guy is running scams on your membership. He has taken over control of the meeting. The guy really is charismatic. And, uh, and he's been doing it for 30 years. I, I watched him selling uh, miracles to poor Hispanics in Texas in 1973, for God's sake. And uh, so they uh, had they hired an attorney and wrote had him write a letter that said you're no longer welcome on these premises and if you return we will call the police for trespassing and uh, have you arrested. And he got all huffy and said they couldn't do that to him and that's the last we've seen him for this round. I don't think he's pretty old now. He probably won't come back. Um, um, people come to AA meetings for all kinds of reasons. And, um, and your intuition will tell you why they're there. I mean, it, just watch people. And, uh, your intuition works. When you look at someone, you will get a reaction. Try to trust that. Because most of the time it'll be right. And that's a hell of a tool, and most of us really don't ever practice using that. But the book talks about it and says that it gradually becomes a working part of the mind and that we come to trust it. And and so, I mean, there are people in Alcoholics Anonymous to make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. We had one that came into our group that was a pedophile. And see, I work part of my company does therapy on sex offenders. And um, and this guy came into our group, and I, boy, all the bells and whistles are going off. And uh, uh, we asked him to leave. I also had the law changed in Colorado, where pedophiles are no longer allowed by their parole agreement. Uh, to come into Alcoholics Anonymous meetings where there are children present by their parole agreement. So now if they do that, uh, they violate their parole and they go back to prison. So isn't that nasty? <laughs> Screw them. <laughs> Those people don't get well. Um, the recidivism rate among pedophiles is uh, way up in the 90th percentile. So uh, so there are a lot of challenges that come up. Anyway, we're talking about inventory. So institutions, so we talked about, did anybody say the courts? Huh? I mean, surely a couple of you have run afoul of the courts. <laughs> um, okay, so you do it the same way. You write it in four columns. You answer the same questions. Okay? Does anyone have any questions about either people or institutions? Yeah. Yes, you do. Hi. That's right, sponsor. <laughs> I'm Anita, and I'm an alcoholic. And for my inventory that I had started, when you're not, what do you do when... You, I never really get mad at people. I mean, now I I have to feel feelings that I never felt, so that's right. really hard. But the person I'm most mad at is myself. Sure. And then it would be, I can't say I'm mad at my husband, but I'm upset with him. Is that the same thing? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's mad. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Do you, 
How many of you have, have sponsored people who go, but I don't have any resentment? Do you know, why is that going on? Do you know why? That for sure. And why else? What's going on there with people who Denial. don't get angry? Huh? Denial. Denial. Absolutely. So some people have that um, so buried in their psyche that they that they just say, "Oh, gosh, <laughs> I just don't get mad at people." And so I, you know, I I suppose I could dredge up a couple, but. Um, I really am not mad at every anybody. I'm just fine. And you wonder what kind of drugs they're on. Um, so, yeah, but that's like a psychological roadblock. And sometimes you just have to... I'll, I'll tell you in a minute about fear. And I'll tell you about my roadblock with fear. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, hi, I'm Taryn. I'm an alcoholic. I, I don't want to get too off course, but you've brought it up twice now um, yes. with the intuition, yes. trusting your intuition. And yesterday with having the courage to stand up yes. and say what you, you know, to somebody. Um, when, you, when I come in here, um, and I don't have a lot of years, um, I don't trust anything that goes on in my head. And, you know, I look to guidance from other people. So having the courage to stand up, to somebody and say something that I don't know if I'm going to mess them up. You know, I don't, I don't trust what's in my head. Yes. And having intuition, my intuition that is everyone's out to get me. You know, I mean, that's what I come in with. So at what point can you trust that you've talked to enough people and you've learned enough and you've gotten in touch um, that, that you can trust that? Because I'm still, to you know, after after time, I'm, I'm still not not trusting what goes on inside my head. Right. And I know it's supposed to move to your heart, and then you... But I don't know when that conversion happens, so... All right. Um, thank you. The, uh, there's a line in the book that says, For after all, God gave us brains to use. Now, here's the problem with Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous itself is a two-edged sword. And we tell people things that sound good and may move them in the right direction, but it also may move them in the wrong direction. And one of those things that we say in Alcoholics Anonymous is, your very best thinking brought you here. All right? So then we assume that our thought process or our cognitive process has a lot of holes in it, right? So if we continue to believe that, uh, we will never be free of our disease. And that, so, so the line in the book that says, for after all God gave us brains to use, is a good one because it says that our brains work. Now, we hear all of this silly stuff, like, for your very best thinking got you here. Um, and my very best thinking didn't get me here. Uh, my very worst thinking got me here. Um, there's nothing wrong with my cognitive process unless I believe there's something wrong with my cognitive process. As long as I think that I'm incapable of, of um, making good decisions, I won't. Life's kind of funny that way. Um, so at some point, you have to dredge up the courage to start making decisions and to find out that you do have the capacity. You're, this is, And we're going to get to this in just a minute, but it is the whole concept of damaged goods. And the, the whole concept of damage, being damaged goods as a result of our alcoholism, is an outrageous lie. And, and the beliefs that we are incapable of making rational decisions and that that will continue on into infinity somewhere is a horrible, horrible miscarriage. Um, it's, you know, whether someone else told us that, you make bad decisions. 
or whether we decide it as a result of our experience that we make bad decisions. That is not indicative of what we can really do. I make decisions for my company, for my family, for my home group. I make decisions about all of those things every day. And most of them are good. And they're based on good information or the best information at hand. Sometimes I make a mistake. I probably make lots of mistakes, but I probably make more good decisions than mistakes. And so the whole idea that I can't, that I'm going to screw something up, will prevent me from ever doing anything. That'll make my life empty. It'll make, it'll make me indecisive and frozen in place. And the trick here is to move away from that. And one of the things that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to start making decisions to prove to yourself that you have the capacity to do that. And that's going to take some courage. But there's another line in the book that says men of faith have courage. Men of faith have courage. And, and I used to sit there and look at that line and go, if they've got faith, what the hell do they need courage for? <laughs> and it's because my faith is imperfect. So sometimes the most courage I can get is just getting one foot in front of the other. You know what kind of courage I want? I want the kind where I, they paint a red S on my chest. And I go, I'll take care of it. Uh, and sometimes all I can do is, I'm really scared, but I'll do it anyway. And I go out there and do it. Okay? So is it reasonable to continue on with that idea about your own ability to make decisions? No. And so we're going to talk about that in a minute because there's a way to inventory it. And every one of those beliefs is a lie. Every single one. And you are not who you think you are. And I can tell you that with absolute clarity. And that the person you really are is so much more than who you think you are. Yeah. I'm Susan, I'm an alcoholic. Um, the column where it asks about um, what part you had in it, my biggest resentment is the fact that my mother put me up for adoption. Um, I had no part in that whatsoever. I was two weeks old. Right. What do I... How do I explain that as a, you know, that boggles my mind. Well, you're, you're, the only place you're going to have a problem dealing with that is in the fourth column where it says, where am I selfish? And if you're two years old, your question is, two how the hell old. can I be selfish? I was two years old. Two weeks old. Two weeks old. Mm -hmm. Or how could you be dishonest or how could you be self-seeking or how could you be frightened? Those are good questions, but I, I'm not sure that you were, okay? The other questions about how did that affect your self-esteem, mm -hmm. those questions have an almost overwhelming answer. How did it affect your self-esteem? made me feel like I wasn't worthwhile. How did it affect my security? It put me in a family I didn't know, I, or I, someone other than my family of origin. How did it affect my ambitions? Well, I always thought I was adopted and not as good as anyone else. How did it affect my personal relations? I was uh, never thought that I was as good as other people. How did it affect my sex relations? I sought out people that were what we call lower companions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Are you nodding? <laughs> yeah, I am. Thank you. I don't see the harm. I don't. I mean, if you're, if you're a child, you really, the, the, the selfish and dishonest and self-seeking and frightened things happen after the fact. There. They don't happen right then. But I can, I can adopt an attitude from having been in that circumstance that I can write about in selfish, dishonest, self-seeking and fright. Because I can, as soon as I adopt this attitude that I am damaged goods again, uh, and um, I'm, I'm doing all kinds of things that are counterproductive to my own life. 
All right. Um, so let's talk about principles. What are principles? Yeah, here. Now, I, I'm going to tell you this story. I was uh, 28 years sober, and I'm doing my 11th step. And I'm having this conversation with God. I'm the only one talking. And I said, and I'm looking at my 11th step, and I said, what, how do you explain me being sober for 28 years and I still believe all this nonsense about myself that's self-defeating? Uh, for instance, I believe that if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. I believe that I'll never be a success. I'll believe that I'm never, I'll never be financially secure. I believe that the only reason why any woman would ever have a relationship with me is because of my ability to make money. Um, I believe that I'm a fraud. I believe that what people think I am is not what I am. Um, and I had this whole laundry list of beliefs. I don't believe that I'm good enough. That's a, that, that belief is a tragedy because it's a trap. Good enough for what? See, as soon as I say I'm not good enough, that's awful. But I haven't defined anything. Um, so, uh, so I'm looking at all those beliefs and I have heard voices twice in my life. I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. Once on the plane back from Tampa where I heard you're done. And, um, and I stopped talking or doing things like this at conventions for three years, trying to put a marriage back together and, and to coach little league soccer. And, um, and this time, and I'm sitting there and what I heard was principles. And I, and I'm having this conversation. See, that's just silly. It sounds like, uh, it's in spiritual make believe. And, uh, and I'm having this conversation, and I said, what the hell's it got to do with principles? Principles are honesty, open-mindedness, willingness, things like that. And the answer was, no, your principles are those beliefs that are so deeply embedded in your personality that they influence every decision that you make. And you are loaded with self-defeating principles. You are loaded with ideas that will prevent you from ever becoming the person God intended you to be. And I said, so what do I do with it? And the answer was, put the, put the self-defeating belief in the first column. That's one of the principles that influences your life every day. Now, if, if I thought that I was the only one that believed that stuff, I wouldn't bring it up. Right? So I, I'm having this conversation and I put, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me in the first column. And the next question was the second column, which is the cause. And so I ask myself, what's the cause of believing that? And the cause is that I was told from the time I was about 10 years old that I was going to die in a gutter just like my alcoholic father or that I would die in a mental institution, which was a place that my mother visited on regular occasions, and that I had no chance at all that my future was already determined and that it was one of those endings and uh, that was the way it was. And that's the cause. And then I thought, well, this is interesting. So I moved over to the third column and I, and I asked the question, does this affect my self-esteem? That you got the same response I did. All right? 
Does it affect my self-esteem? It destroys my self-esteem. Does it affect my security? Oh boy, if you, if at some point you're going to figure out you don't like me, I can't ever get secure in a job because my boss is going to look at me and go, man, we made a big mistake with you. And I can't ever get secure in a relationship because at some point they're going to get up one morning and be out of there faster than I could spit. I can't ever get secure in anything. I can't get secure in friendships because at some point they're going to go, you're really not the kind of guy I want to hang around with. So does it affect my security? Yeah. Does it affect my ambitions? Yeah, why would I try anything? Do you know one of the big reasons that differentiates people who become successful in business and who aren't successful in business is a willingness to risk. I know people who who are not great business people, who are not particularly brilliant, who are not people who have above average skills, who become outrageously successful in business for no other reason than they were willing to try. They went out and did it when everybody else was locked in place. Um, so does it affect my ambitions? Yeah. I sort of lose my ambition. Because I think, well, if I go try that, maybe I can't do it and then everybody's going to think I'm stupid or that I'm unsuccessful or that I'm a bum or whatever that is. Does it affect my personal relations? Yeah. Why would I form friendships if they're going to catch up with me at some point and say, go away? Does it affect my sex relations? Yeah, because I probably couldn't have any that lasted long enough and I'm tired of having my backside ripped off in a ra relationship and having someone looking at you with a, with a, a look of indifference and contempt and walking away saying you were never worth the time. So I'm not going to go gladly into forming an intimate relationship. So what happens from that belief, that belief that became a principle in my life? It's destroyed me. It's locked me in place. It's made me live a life of fear. It's prevented me from ever becoming who I could be. And I've never met anyone in Alcoholics Anonymous who hasn't had a head full of this stuff. I sit in meetings and listen to people talk about themselves and I want to weep. Because people have such a diminished view of themselves and that's the way they're walking through life. And we all do it. And so the question that I have for you is, are you tired of it? Are you ready to let it go? Are you ready to find out who you really are? Are you willing to become someone entirely different? And are you willing to change your mind? Now I'll tell you some silly beliefs. I'll never be a success. I already am a success. I'll never be financially secure. I already am financially secure. How could I possibly believe something that reality flies in the face of? Because I chose to. Because those seeds were generally planted when I was a child. All right? You're a bum. You're never going to amount to anything. You'll always be a failure. You're going to wind up in one of these two places or dead. And so I planted those seeds, or those seeds were planted with me when I was a child. And I have nourished and fertilized those seeds for for almost 60 years. Well, chop the goddamn thing down and throw it away. 
When you get to the bottom of the third column, where you've asked yourself what this affects, the one difference that I do that isn't in the book, and I'll tell you about it anyway, is I ask one question at the end of the third column, and that is, is this a lie? Now, they're all lies. There are no truths in self-defeating beliefs. None at all. And it, every once in a while I'll get a call from somebody out of town or whatever, and they'll call me up and go, I found one. And then it, they're never true. They're all lies. And so I get to the bottom of the third column and I say, is this a lie? And, I, and they're all lies. So I have, And the only reason why that question is there is because I want to be absolutely clear that I believe a lie. Because as soon as I'm clear that I believe a lie, I don't want to be around it anymore. So I ask God to remove it. So I'm looking at this. You wouldn't, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. And why is it selfish to believe that? It's selfish because I know it's not the truth. But I've had it for so long and I'm so comfortable with it that I don't even want to challenge it. It's buried so deeply into my personality that I don't want to dredge it out and look at it. I, you know, sometimes we look at right in inventory and go, Jesus, just give me a break. You know, when do I get to go on about the business of living? And in this sort of constant self-examination uh, is nice, but when do you get a break? Uh, the real truth is that I know it's a lie, and I just didn't want to challenge it. And that's selfish. Why is it dishonest? It's dishonest to believe a lie. Where is it self-seeking? That's the tricky one. In that belief, it's self-seeking because it allows me to be a victim. All right? I can explain anyway away any kind of failure by saying, well, you know, uh, if people really get to know me, they just don't like me. And so that's never going to work. Um, and that's the way it is. And two of the biggest lies, two of the biggest lies in life are that's the way it is and that's the way I am. And those can explain away anything. You go, well. So, um, and why is it frightening? Because I think it might be true. But it isn't. But it frightens me. So I started writing that inventory when I was 28 years sober. I've been writing it for eight years, and I haven't found the bottom of it yet. Now, here's the thing. The only reason why I got on the plane and came all the way across the country to sit here is because I know that your mind works like mine. And I don't want you to spend the rest of your life believing the kind of bullshit that's floating around in your head any more than I want to spend the rest of my life believing the bullshit that's floating around in my head. And that life can offer you so much more if you will challenge all of those things that were planted, most of them by parents or whatever, some authority figure when you, most of the stuff will go back to your childhood. And, and I don't want you to have to believe all of that silly stuff. Uh, and I want you to have a choice. Now, whether you take that choice, that's your business. But I can tell you that the older I get, the more important it is for me to understand the truth. And if I am living in a lie, I don't want to live there anymore. I just don't. I want to know the truth. And it mostly 
because the more we learn in this program, the more effective we become in helping other alcoholics. And when, you know, not drinking is nice, but it's not enough. You know, just because you quit drinking, nobody ought to pin a goddamn badge on you. <laughs> That's just the beginning. So at some point, we have to lose the insanity. Now, what's the bottom line? The bottom line to writing a principal inventory is I am a child of God and unequal to anyone on the face of this planet. I said that last night. No better, no worse, but an equal. And that puts me on even footing with everyone else in this world. And so I do not bow before anyone. Uh, you know, that kills the whole idea of being damaged goods. As soon as I am willing to believe that I am a child of God and an equal to anyone, I am no longer able to swing on this handle of being damaged goods. Because it just isn't true. I'm not damaged goods. Um, you know, I've, I've been down some muddy roads in my life. But um, that doesn't alter my relationship with God. And my relationship with God is the benchmark in my life. Everything else is loses its relevance. And my relationship with God is my primary concern. One of the reasons why I don't defend myself anymore is because I understand that my primary issue in life is my relationship with God. And my intuition tells me who I want to be. And I try and be that. And I believe that that is pleasing to God. And my purpose in life is to lead a life that is pleasing to God. And well, let me... Um, we'll talk about it, but it's, you know, in the seven-step prayer... It talks about, uh, I, I now ask you to remove every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. God gets to choose. Okay? So, so I'm confrontive, aggressive, uh, offensive, uh, profane, um, and I'm looking at all that stuff going, surely, <laughs> Those are defects of character. And, um, and I have been asking for 36 years for God to remove any, any defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to him and my fellows. And I am still aggressive and profane and abrasive and all of those things. And so I figure God needs somebody like that. And people go, well, you're not trying hard enough. And you go, no, that implies I have a, that I have the power to change myself. And I don't. God has the power to change me. And when I go, when I go to God in the third step and the seventh step, it is with a willingness to become a deaf mute. I don't care. It's just do what you want. And I'm willing to let anything go. Now, the trick is that we become comfortable with our own defects of character. And I can tell you that self-defeating beliefs are defects of character. And so my question to you is, uh, are you willing to change your mind? Are you tired of being who you are? Are you willing to be who God wants you to be? Are you so comfortable with defects that you just don't want to let them go? Because then you're afraid that you're not going to be the person that you were. You ought to be afraid of that because you're not. 
Because at some point, when you lose all those beliefs, you won't be who you were anymore. And some astounding things happen, and people go, wouldn't it? Uh, well, people will comment on them at some point, and part of that has to do with you really don't care what people think of you, do you? You don't know, I'm living a life that I choose to live, and that's the way I'm going to live. And if someone takes issue with that, I certainly hope they come to terms with it. Um, I am who I want to be. And I have the freedom to do that. Um, yes. Hi. Hi. I'm sitting here um, just thinking, which is dangerous and good at the same time for me, but um, and I'm questioning some things, that, some beliefs that I've had for a long time, excuse yeah. me, time around inventory, which is also a good thing. And one of the things I've always heard that I've always passed on um, is that you never put yourself on on your inventory list, and because that's the most selfish thing you could do. And the idea of inventory is to get rid of self, and that the idea of inventory is not that we feel better about ourselves; it's to to face and be rid of the things that are blocking us from God. So that's my first question. I don't even know if that's a question. I'm just confused with that right now. And then the second thing if you could address is um, whether or not what your thoughts are on making a list of all of your good qualities, because I hear that an awful lot that people suggest doing that. Well, let's see. Let's start with not putting yourself on your inventory. I don't believe that. Um, if I'm mad at myself, I put myself on the inventory, and I do exactly the same process with it. So I was never told that. Um, uh, inventorying beliefs is facing and be ridding the, uh, be getting rid of those things that that keep us away from God. I believe that God had a certain thing in mind for each of us when we were born. Not exactly predestination, but I think he had something in mind. Now, the the fly in the ointment is, is um, uh, that he gave us uh, self-will. So I get to make decisions. And God may have had the best of intent, but if I'm making decisions while I'm drinking that uh, take me down a path away from God's intent, he's kind enough to let us get away with it. It's just like, you know, I'm, I may be practicing all kinds of spiritual principles, but if I take a, a gun, hold it to my head and pull the trigger and it's loaded, it's probably going to go off. And God may look at that and go, that's sad. But uh, he, one of his greatest gifts to us is free will. So, so we go about our lives making our decisions and all the rest of that. The whole business about whether you should write, put yourself on an inventory or not, I don't know. You know, my, my thoughts on that are listen to your sponsor. Um, when I have people write inventory, I have them write about themselves if they resent themselves for some reason because it's a resentment list. Um, and the whole idea that it's selfish to write about yourself would be true if that's all you wrote about. But, um, but if I have real resentments about myself and I'm writing a resentment inventory, I'm going to put it on there. And when I write about principles, which are these deep-seated, self-defeating beliefs, uh, I do have to write about myself because I'm the one that's walking around. I'm the one that, that nourishes those beliefs and keeps them intact when they ought to be cut down and thrown out. Now, does that answer it? Uh, here's the deal. 
Here's what you're going to find if you write that inventory. Most people go into inventory trying to find out who they are. Well, they're trying to try and find, trying to find the truth, and what you find there is the lie. And you don't find out who you are. You find out who you're not. Now, that creates this whole new issue, which is, if I'm not this, if I'm not all these things that I believed I was, who am I? You are a child of God. It all falls back to the bottom line. Now, what happens when you write that kind of inventory? Most people who have all these self-defeating beliefs live in a very narrow world because they think that they don't have the capacity to operate in most venues. They, they think that because they are held back by not being smart enough, not being attractive enough, not being um, uh, whatever, I don't know, good enough, slick enough, whatever. They all think they're held back by those things because they believe them, because those things are all stuck in their personality. And so, so when all these opportunities in life float by them, they're rejected out of hand because they don't feel that they could compete or that they could address those kinds of opportunities or that they, those things uh, are not relevant to them. So they live in this little narrow world where they say, well, I'm really not good enough and I'm not smart enough and I'm not pretty enough or I'm not handsome enough or I'm not slick enough or I don't have enough education or I'm not big enough or I'm not thin enough or I'm not whatever. So that really doesn't have anything to do with me, okay? When when you get all this stuff out of your head, or a bunch of this stuff out of your head, because you'll find more, all of a sudden the world goes like this. And it's like looking at the world through a wide-angle lens. And now all of a sudden... Almost everything has something to do with you. When, they, when the State Department of Corrections came up to me and said, we'd like you to start providing us with psychiatric care, do you know what my head said? Are you fucking out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've probably never done that. You know what I said? I mean, because my head says one thing and my mouth says something else. <laughs> so I'm having this conversation with the head of the parole division, nice lady. And she said, Bob, we'd like you to provide us with psychiatric care. Can you do that? And my mind is screaming. And my voice said, let me look into that. So I called up one of the therapists that's been with me for 15 years and I said, Vicki, do you uh, do you know any psychiatrists that would like to go to work for us? And she said, yeah, a couple of them. And I said, why would they go to work for us? And she said, because managed care is killing their business. And, w and I said, well, let me look into that. And I found out we could pay them more and faster than managed care did. So I called a couple of psychiatrists and I said, here's what I'm offering. Do you have any interest in that? And they went, oh, yeah. And so I hired a staff of psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners and am, am providing services to the parole division, providing psychiatric services to the parole division, and I'm one of the largest providers in the state of Colorado. And, uh, and my mind, when I was presented with that idea, not only rejected it, just went off on a tear. Um, my perception is faulty. 
even after all these years, after all these steps, after all this work, my perception still looks at myself like I just fell off a manure spreader in Wisconsin. <laughs> and the reason why the Department of Corrections does so much business with me is because I am a talented and astute business person. <laughs> That's humility. I am good at what I do. Otherwise, they wouldn't do business with me. So are you willing to change your mind about who you are? I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't know where you've been and what you did, and I don't care about any of that. All I'm telling you is that you are more than you think you are. And if you are willing to accept that, go take a look and prove it. Got any questions about that? It, huh? Yeah. You want to go over to the microphone so I can hear you? Just a comment on whether sure. it's uh, okay to put yourself on the inventory or not. Sure. I used to think that it wasn't because the big book didn't specifically say that you should, so therefore I figured, well, you probably shouldn't put yourself on there. But I, I've come to change my mind. I've also seen that our sister fellowship, Al-Anon, which has the benefit of more years of experience dealing with alcoholics and more time that in their um, – some of that literature, it says that it's okay to put yourself on the uh, list of, uh, you know, resentments and, and fears. So I think today it's, it's a good you. thing to do as long as I'm not the only thing on the, the list. There. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, we're going we're gonna to take a break now. I'm sure you started thinking about that. So why don't you go? Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.